Deuteronomy 28.1. Uh, I read. Uh -huh. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands that I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. Okay. Somebody got something different? 28.1. I just wonder if it's if you, if Go ahead. you obey the Lord, you are God, and carefully follow all his commands, I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. And then verse 2 says, and all of these blessings will come upon you. Or another translation says, all of these blessings will chase you down. Does anybody have that particular translation? No. All of these blessings will pursue you. Does anybody have that in verse 2? Verse 2. You see it? Deuteronomy. Let me look it up. All of these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord. Or all of these blessings will pursue you or all of these blessings will chase you. Does anybody have anything like that in 28.2 in your translation? Or come after? No, I think, I think uh, we are reading, uh, I'm reading from NIV. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's the NLT. What do you have, Pastor Innocent, in verse 2? NIV. Oh, you have NIV? Okay. Yeah. Well, many of the translations, the what it's saying is these blessings are going to come after you. You know, if you obey the Lord, these blessings will come after you, or they will pursue you. Uh, so I was thinking the other morning, these blessings will come after you or pursue you. So my question is this, are we pursuing the blessing? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, it doesn't tell us to pursue the blessing. Yes. It says pursue the blesser. <laughs> and if you'll pursue the blesser, the blessings will run you down. The blessings will chase after you. And I think sometimes we get caught up in chasing the blessing and not the blesser. And so, you know, the Bible says that Israel, Israel sought the hand of God, but Moses sought the face of God. So the question is, are you seeking his hand, his blessing, or are you seeking his face, knowing him? And I think we pursue the blessing and not the blesser, and because we're pursuing the blesser and not the blessing, uh, and not the blesser, the blessings never catch us. <laughs> because we're chasing down the wrong thing. If we would be busy running after God, you don't have to think about the blessings. 
They're going to run you down. They're going to overtake you. But, you know, we're seeking other things. And it's the, it's the, the New Testament translation of that would be, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things I'm going to add to you. So many times we seek all of these things <laughs> and we're not seeking the kingdom of God. Or we're chasing the blessing when we ought to chase the blesser. And if you chase the blesser, you don't have to worry about the blessings that are going to be there. But I, I just see a lot of people using a lot of energy and a lot of effort pursuing blessings. You know, we pray for blessings. <laughs> we, we work for blessings. We're obeying God so we'll be blessed. But you need to obey God because you love him, the blessings that take care of themselves. <laughs> you know, you can't blackmail God. You know, you can't say, now, God, I'm, I'm going to chase you so you'll bless me. That's blackmail. <laughs> you, just need to be, you just need to be occupied with chasing after his face, going after God. And then you just turn around and you look behind you and you'll go, wow, those blessings, they're just fixing to overtake me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just make sure you're pursuing the right that don't pursue blessings, pursue the blesser. <laughs> Amen. 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 So um well, we got a lot to talk about today. I, I was thinking a lot about Franklin, what you said at our last Bible study. You know, like and I really could feel your heart. It's like, you know, we don't know Greek or Hebrew or we don't have all these tools. So how do we translate and get the stuff, get the accurate translation, you know, from reading the Bible that we have that's not a good translation? You know, you were kind of, that's kind of what you were saying, I think, right? Yeah. And, and I really, I can really feel that uh, struggle within you, you know, like, I want the truth, I want to see that, but, you know, maybe we don't have that education, we don't have those kind of tools, but I want the truth. And, and you know, as I prayed about it, it's like, if you'll take a passage of scripture, like I have in this Bible study, and pray over it. He'll, the Holy Spirit will teach you the truth. You know, you may not have access to the Greek language and all this stuff, but if you'll pray and say, God, I want to know what this passage really means. And he might lead you to something online. Does that make sense? He may lead you to a book or a reference. But because you're asking him to help you, you know, he may lead you to a source that answers that prayer. Or maybe a Bible teacher or something. Because, you know, when he sees our heart that we want the truth, he doesn't turn a deaf ear to that. You know, and we have to remember that in Paul's day, when he was writing these letters, 90% of the church was illiterate. That's amazing. <laughs> They couldn't even read the letters that Paul wrote. But look at the revelation that that church had. Though 90% were illiterate, they had phenomenal revelation. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's not about, do I know the language? Do I have a good trace? It's really about the Holy Spirit. Really about praying over a passage of Scripture. And there, there are some Scriptures that... I still am not sure exactly what they mean. But, uh, you know, God knows that I'm seeking that. And, you know, if I really sat down and pursued it, I, I could find it. But there's so much. Man, there's just so many questions we all have. You know what I'm saying? 
you just have to kind of pick uh, what you're going to study and research and find the truth in. But it's something that everybody struggles with. Okay. Um, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12, spiritual gifts. Wow, this is, uh, <laughs> I'm recording because, yeah. hi, you're going to really, this is something that, uh, you know, I wish every church knew, uh, but let me read it. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and then we'll break it down. Now, you know, just to give you the background, we've talked about a very divided church, a, a new church, a baby church, in the midst of a very wicked culture. Uh, you know, there was Jews and Greek. Uh, you know, there was just a... a Sylvia, I can see you. We can hear you. Prophet Sylvia, I can hear you. We can see you. Hey, sorry. So that's okay. You're good. Uh, so, you know, you have to understand that Paul is answering a lot of questions. Eating meat offered to idols, uh, the immorality in the church. Uh, later on, he discusses the resurrection. Now he's discussing spiritual gifts. This is a baby church that uh, was really doing pretty good as far as spiritual gifts, but they were out of balance and creating disorder when they would come together as a church. And so Paul says to him in verse one, now about spiritual gifts, and I like that he added this next word, brothers. So, you know, you can see his love for them. You can see that uh, they're family, they're family. And you got to understand, he's not talking about the Jewish family. He's talking about the family of God because there was Jews and Greeks in the church. So concerning the spiritual gifts, and you know, every translation says spiritual gifts, but that it's one word in the Greek. It's charismata is the Greek word. And it basically means spirituals. The spiritual gifts, uh, the Greek word, charismata, comes from the word charis, which means grace. So these are grace gifts, gifts that are given to us because of God's grace, not for anything else. So because of God's grace, that means you may be a prophet or an apostle, but that doesn't make you greater than the servant because it's because of his grace you have that gift. And so it's called spirit. And by the way, the word charismata, kera, is the word for joy. So when you operate in spiritual gifts that is because of the grace of God, you'll always have great joy. Now, if you're a teacher, Frank, maybe you're a teacher. When you start teaching and that anointing comes on you, it brings mm -hmm. great joy. <laughs> you know, you're like, hallelujah. It's just, it doesn't get better than this. Uh, when you have an evangelist that's given an invitation and 50 people get saved, nothing brings that evangelist a greater joy because his spiritual gift, because of the grace of God, brings great joy. So concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. So he's saying, we, we need to have an understanding here. There, it's creating problems in the church, so let's get an understanding. You know that you were pagans. You already know this. You came out of these pagan temples in Corinth, and somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, 
but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings of these gifts, but the same God works all of them in all men. I want you to notice the Trinity there. Different kinds of service, but the same Lord, Jesus. Different kinds of working, but the same God. Verse 4, different kinds of spirit, spirit gifts, but the same Spirit. So the Trinity, the Spirit, the Lord, and God, which is basically one, are at work in the gifting of the church. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given, and here's where a lot of people miss it, for the common good. For the common good. The purpose of the gifts is for the common good, not for your good. Not so people will ooh and ah over how dynamic you are, or what a great speaker you are, or how anointed you are. It's for the common good. It's not to build you up, but to build the church up. To the one that is given the message through the Spirit of wisdom. So that's a gift, the word of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith. To another, gifts of healing. And by the way, that's the only gift that is plural. It's gifts of healings. None of the other ones are plural except for the healings, gifts of healings. We'll talk about that if we get to it. To another miracle, miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another speaking in a different kind of tongue, and still another, the interpretations of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. So there he's making a big emphasis about how the spiritual gifts are supposed to work. Then he kind of says, he kind of changes direction. The body is a unit. Though it's made up of many parts, a hand, ears, right? It's still one body. So it is with Christ. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether you're a Jew, a Greek, a slave, or a free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. So it doesn't matter what your background is. We're one body. It doesn't matter what your gift is. We're still one body. Now the body is made up, is not made up of one part, but many. So I'm not a finger walking around or an ear walking around. My body is many parts that's walking around. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. <laughs> it would not be for that reason, for that reason to cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not for the reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special attention. But God combined the members of the body and gave a greater honor to the parts that lack it. So that there should be no division in the body. But, it, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one suffers part, every part suffers with it. I love that. If one part of the body is honored, every part 
rejoices with it. Now you're the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. And the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, prophets, teachers, workers. And by the way, this is not an order. This is not saying that, first of all, the most important one is. Because he just addressed that. <laughs> because I know some people say, well, first of all, there's apostles. That's the number one gift. But he just got through saying, no, 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 look, the eye is needed as much as the hand, the foot is needed as much, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden people preach, now, I'm the apostle, and you know that's the number one, that's top person, I'm, I'm number one. <laughs> it's like they didn't read the whole chapter. And then you have the gifts of healings, those that are able to help others, gifts of administration, those that speak in different kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I want to show you the more excellent way, which we know is love. So, wow, there is so much in this, and we're going to go as far as we can. But uh, first, I just want to kind of give you the big picture. I want to kind of put it together. And I was thinking, what's a good way to put this together? The whole chapter, what is God saying? Uh, I, I don't know if you're a movie buff, but I love movies. Uh, the way I relax is I watch a good movie. <laughs> and that's I mean, I like zone out. When I'm in the movie, I'm in the movie. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm like into it. And there was a movie in 2012 called The Avengers. Did, did anybody see The Avengers? It was a Marvel, you know, the superheroes. Yes. You know, the superheroes. Well, The Avengers is a story of a bunch of superheroes with superpowers. <laughs> yeah. Superheroes with superpowers. And they came together to battle an evil force that wanted to dominate the world. That's what the movie is about. Superhuman superpowers to fight a force that wanted to dominate the world. But the only problem was the superheroes were unable to work together in the movie. Timo's smiling. I think he remembers it. You know, they were fighting yeah. each other. And they weren't able to get along. And they were backbiting each other and talking bad about this person over here and how he wasn't good for the team. And, but the bad guy was smart enough, the enemy in the movie Avengers, he anticipated that the superpowers would not work together. <laughs> it's in the movie. The enemy said, I know they're going to fight and they're not yeah. going to get along. And that's going to give me leverage. That's going to weaken the superpowers. And, uh, and, and the super, the evil, the diabolical power that wanted to dominate the world almost won. But there was an agent that brought the superpowers together called Nick Fury. <laughs> this is so cool. Timo smiling. And he brought them together because he knew if we could get this group of superpowers together, the world could be saved. But they would have to work together to fight this battle. Now, unfortunately, the first half of the Avengers movie is pretty much made up of them squabbling and not getting along. Now, we are God's superheroes. Amen. You're a superhero. You're, see, when you get saved, you're not just an ordinary person. You're extraordinary. <laughs> mm. You're not ordinary. You're extraordinary. Amen. 
You're not nominal. You're phenomenal. <laughs> because you've been bought with the blood of Jesus and you have a superpower called a gift or giftings. Now, nobody in the world has these superpowers but those superheroes in the church. But Amen. the enemy that wants to destroy the world and the church is having his way because the church can't work together. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's only when we work together that we're going to conquer the enemy that wants to dominate the world. And God's given us these great gifts. And, and basically, Paul, he's the Nick Fury. <laughs> he's the agent that says, come on, y'all. The only way we're going to defeat the enemy in the city of Corinth is if we as superpowers work together. Because, see, in Corinth, one was saying, well, I'm an apostle. Everybody else is under me, see, because mm -hmm. I'm the big dog. Mm -hmm. I'm the big dog. All you other guys, y'all are little dogs. But me, I'm the main man. And then the other one would say, well, look, I speak in tongues. And then this one would say, yeah, but I'll prophesy. <laughs> and so you have all these superpowers that are colliding while the enemy's having his way. Whereas if we came together, we would be a force that would defeat the enemy. And that's that is what Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians 12. Let me give you some points that you should write down about the gifts. If the gift does not point to Jesus, it's not a gift. If the gift does not point to Jesus, it's not a gift. So if your gifting points to you, it's a counterfeit gift. It may look like the gift apostle. It may look like the gift of teacher. Let me tell you a lot. I'm just going to throw this out, but it's a teaching on its own, but... <clears throat> A lot of what we think is the anointing is nothing but a fleshly anointing. It's not a spiritual anointing. We learn our gifting so much, the expression of our gift, how our gift looks, how our gift operates, we learn those things about our gifting so much that we can even do it in the flesh. Think about that. And so that anointing that you feel and that people in the church feel is really more of a demonic anointing because it's in the flesh. But if it's a spirit anointing, Jesus becomes the central figure in the use of that gifting. Jesus is exalted. And anytime a person is exalted or a thing is exalted, it's a false gift. And when you read 1 Corinthians 12, you can see it in there. And so Paul was saying, no, you know, it needs to lift up Jesus. Here's another point about a spiritual gift. Number two, if spiritual gifts don't benefit the body, if a spiritual gift does not benefit the body, it's not a gift. When you're operating in your gift, not only should Jesus be the central focus, but the edifying, the building up, and the encouragement of the church 
should be a focus. If the church is not being benefited from this, it's a counterfeit gift. And you can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 11. The purpose of a gift, the manifestation is for the common good. Not for your good, not to put you in the limelight, but to put the church in the limelight. To build the church up, not to build you up. And you know, you see this as well as I do. You know, I can, I can watch a preacher, and you, I hope you can, and I can tell right away who they're lifting up. <laughs> Are they trying to make themselves look good? Are they trying to make Jesus look good? Are they trying to build themselves up? Or is it for the common good in building up the church? A true spiritual gift, always, 100% of the time, benefits the body. First Peter chapter 4, 10 and 11 says, each one of us should use whatever gift we received in order to serve others. <laughs> in order to serve others. That's why, you know, the greatest gift is service, being a servant. That's the greatest, being a servant. Jesus never called himself an apostle, but he called Amen. himself a servant. He never called himself a bishop. He called himself a servant. He never called himself an evangelist, but he called himself a servant. So the purpose of the gift is to serve and encourage the body, okay? Number three, if the body is not coordinated, it's not effective. I'll explain. If the body is not coordinated, it's not effective. If the body isn't coordinated and cooperating, it's not going to be effective. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 through 26. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 through 26. And that's where it talks about it's working together. I see, my body needs my hand. See, if my body said, look, I'm the head. <laughs> I don't need that hand. If my body said that, how would I eat? <laughs> my hand grabs the food that feeds my face, that makes my... What if my feet said, I don't want to cooperate? How am I going to get to the food? It takes all of the body working together to be a body. You know, uh, when I first got saved, I tried to be a, a fundi like Timo, but I'm not a good fundi at all. <laughs> but when I was trying to be a fundi, I would have a hammer to put the nail in and I would hit my finger. Wow. Oh, it hurts. I know Timo's done it. It hurts. And I remember I would say, praise the Lord. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, it may have come out of my mouth, but my brain was saying something else. <laughs> but when I hit my, my thumb, a very small part of my body, the nerves told my brain what to say. Now, if the spirit's working, he'll interfere <laughs> and make my mouth say something different. But the nerves would tell my body, and all of the blood would rush to that to bring healing. And all of my body began to work together because my thumb got hurt. Mm. And that's what Paul is saying. It should be coordinated and cooperating. But we don't always see that. You know, 
I'm glad sitting here right now that my heart is cooperating with my kidney and my liver and my lungs and my brain. Because if those parts of my body were fighting right now, <laughs> how could I sit here and teach? If my body was saying, oh, look, I'm more important than you, and, and my tongue said to my heart, I'm more important than the heart, well, then my heart said, well, try this. I'll just stop beating. <laughs> now let your tongue talk. What if my lung said, I'm more important than the heart? My lung said, watch this. I'll just stop taking in air. So you see, it takes, that's why he called us the body. All of your body right now is intricate working together so that you can even sit there and hear what I'm saying. But as a church, we don't work together. We're like the Avengers. And so we're not effective. But if we're going to be effective, we have to cooperate with one another. You know, muscular dystrophy and cerebral palsy, they're uh, diseases of the central nervous system. And because of these yeah. diseases, what happens is the body becomes ineffective in communicating with itself. And so that's why, you know, they can't control their muscles because the brain is not cooperating with the muscles. And so this central nervous system disease affects the functioning of the body. And I, I think that the church today has spiritual cerebral palsy. Ooh. Spiritual muscular dystrophy. Because it's not functioning together then the body begins to look retarded and deformed. Ooh. But if we would function together as a body, well, I'm able to do much more than someone with cerebral palsy. They can barely grab a fork to eat because it's mm. not cooperating with one another. And if all the gifts would come together in the church and function as one, you're talking about a super force, super powers, powers that can bring down the enemy, strengthen the church, uh, powers that bring freedom to people that are in bondage, powers that can reach entire communities. But we're going to have to function together. And, and you know, Back to the Avengers, early in the movie, what brought them together? What finally made these superpowers work together was, was one of the superpowers was willing to die in the movie. Mm -hmm. He gave his life. And by the death of that one superpower, all of the rest of the superpowers unified because of that one death. And the body of Christ should unify over the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what brings us together, the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what brings us to love one another. And love is the perfect bond of unity. So that, that's kind of an overview, okay, <clears throat> of chapter 12. Now, I'm going to kind of change gears on you, okay? Because <laughs> everything that I see in the Bible is related to the kingdom of God. I've told you that before. Everything. Yes. So... Spiritual gifts is God's way of bringing heaven to earth. 
Mm. Spiritual gifts is an an interruption into our world by God's superpowers. God invades our world through miracles, prophecy, healings, tongues, interpretation. See, those are spiritual gifts. They're not from this world. <laughs> yes. That nothing in this world can duplicate a spiritual gift. It can counterfeit it. But spiritual gifts stand alone. There's nothing that compared to this. Mir a miracle is God intervening into the powers of nature. Mm. Right? See, yes. Peter walking on water. We know that the laws of nature say your weight of your body, according to physics, the water cannot hold it. And when you step on it, you will go down. That's physics, right? That's yes. the laws of nature. But a miracle is when God intervenes into the laws of nature and something super nature happens. Supernatural. <laughs> Are we together? Yes. It's super nature. It's kingdom coming to earth that doesn't operate by the laws of nature, but it's supernatural. Wisdom. That is an intervention of God into earth. The spirit of wisdom or the word of wisdom or the wisdom of God that James said we can ask for. That that's no, has nothing to do with the natural realm. It doesn't have to do with education. It doesn't have to do that you have a, a PhD. It has nothing to do with anything in this world because words of wisdom and God's wisdom comes from a different dimension. And it's that his dimension invading our dimension, his kingdom invading our kingdom with something supernatural. Super nature. Are we together on this? Yes. So wisdom. It's see wisdom and any of the gifts, healings, prophecy. Th this is all, I'm gonna say it this way: this is all natural in the kingdom. Amen. But yeah. supernatural in our world. See, natural. It's natural in God's kingdom. We need to get God's kingdom to our city. And God's way of intervening into our culture is through spiritual gifts. The spiritual realm invading earth. And, and you can't operate without this. And see, churches do. See, we... we <laughs> We, and I see this so much, look, and I've been guilty of this too. If the lights are right, see, if we can get the lighting on the stage just right, it's going to be anointed. See, like, if you could just hit this note, see, you... You've got to be able to hit that. If you can hit that note in the worship, the anointing's going to fall. Are you hearing me? Yes. All of that's natural. Oh. You know, and I really, let me tell you, it became a full revelation to me when I came to Africa. Mm. Let me tell you why. At the church I pastored, the gathering, I wanted the lights to be right. We had intelligent lighting, thousands of dollars for special lighting, can lights, 
special. We had fog machines. <laughs> I mean, it was, I mean, it was set. We, our choreographed dancers would rehearse once a week so that every move was perfect. And then, and then when it, the music was over and I would go up the steps of the stage to my pulpit, the lighting would all of a sudden come up in the, in the congregation and, and it would begin to rise up. The lighting where I was going to stand would begin. Oh, I mean, it was so good, but do you know, God doesn't need that. So I come to Africa. I'm in the bush under a tree, more people get healed, more people uh -huh. get healed. no smoke machine, no lighting, Amen. no microphone. And it's like God said to me, you had it wrong. See, that's your culture. Your culture is all of that needs to be right to usher in the anointing. Uh-uh. I don't need any of that. I don't need any of that to work. That's true. You see, we can get so focused on the natural, trying to perfect mm. the natural. Whereas if we worked more on the supernatural gifting, what we're really looking for would happen. Because we all want a powerful mm. service. We all want people to get saved and set free. But we have to, and there's nothing wrong with having lights. I'm not saying that's wrong, but let's emphasize the right thing. Let's let our hearts be focused on yeah. the spiritual aspect, the supernatural part, not the natural part that we can control. Because, you know, most preachers are control freaks. See, most preachers, we <laughs> want to be in control. And that's not a bad thing. I think that's a part of a leader. God kind of puts that in you. But what you have to do is allow the Holy Spirit to control that part of you. So we want to take control and be in control. We need to yield to the Holy Spirit and let him take control. So the kingdom of God, see if you can get this, the kingdom of God operates through spiritual gifts. Mm. That's, that's the manifestation. And if we don't have that, the natural mind cannot discern the spiritual things because they're spiritually discerned. First Corinthians chapter two. The natural mind cannot discern spiritual things. But if we focus on being in the natural mind, if you think of things from a natural mindset, you're not going to comprehend the spiritual things. And so Paul is trying to pour this into this church. And by the way, by the time Paul taught on this, um, let me see, I can say this. Um, there wasn't a lot of theology on the Holy Spirit and gifts. You do know all the gifts operated in the Old Testament. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, miracles, Red Seas parting, you know that. So the gifts, you know, were working in the Old And then the New Testament, the gifts were really working. And by the way, Jesus is the only one that's ever walked the earth that every gift operate at 100% all the time. Amen. I mean, he walked in prophecy, healing, discernment, wisdom, knowledge, helps, service. I mean, he, he flowed in all of them. Now, since we're not Jesus, <laughs> we need each other. Amen. I can only function in what God's given me. So I need an administrator. I need mm. a prophet. I need a teacher. You see what I'm saying? 
Jesus stood alone because he had all of it. And then he left and said, now you're going to be the body of Christ. You're going to be just like me with all the gifts. Yes, amen. So you're going to have to work together. You're going to be the body of Christ on earth. And so Paul, that's why he said, I don't want you to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Paul was the first one to put a theology together on the gifts of the Spirit. And he said that the gifts are diverse. The gifts are very diverse. They're different. The gift of service is very different from the gift of prophecy. <laughs> you know, I've, I've very rarely have I ever seen a prophet that had the gift of service. <laughs> Amen. You know, Amen. Most prophets demand that somebody serve them. <laughs> You're getting into trouble. <laughs> so if you're a prophet, you need the body. We need the servant. We need the word of wisdom. So because the 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 gifts are so diverse. And by the way, the, that, the gift, the list in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there's also some in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Ephesians chapter 4, there's some more gifts listed there. 1 Peter chapter 4, there's more gifts. I've counted them up. You know, people say there's 18 gifts, 20 gifts. Uh, Ephesians 4, the gift of leadership. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, <laughs> right? Those are gifts given to the church, according to Ephesians 4. But I think there's more. I don't think that list is exhaustive. You know, you, nowhere in the list do you find intercessor. Mm. But I know I've seen people come under the anointing of intercession. Yes, yes. So I don't think that in the passages here, it's an exhaustive list. Mm -hmm. See, when we get to heaven, we're going to see more than what we know. Oh, amen. So it's not all the, you have to leave room for God to do something strange. Amen. You're going to have to leave room. I think there are some things that God does that, you know, and, and by the way, the, the gifts of the spirit is the working of the kingdom in and through us. But the fruit of the Spirit is the attitude of Jesus. The gifts is the works of Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is the attitude of Jesus. Love, joy, peace, faith, gentleness, kindness, you know that, patience. When Jesus worked in his gifting, because that was the gift perfected, amen? Amen. You, when Jesus prophesied, you, you can't get a more perfect prophet. That's true. So he was the ultimate prophet. Amen. But as a prophet, he always operated with the attitude of love, joy, peace, faith, gentleness, kindness. Never arrogance, pride. Are we together? Yes, we are. See, we get to the gifting part and we lose the attitude. Ooh. The attitude is as important as the gifting. 
That's why the very next chapter 13, he said, let's talk about a more excellent way, love. And, and let me just, I think you all know this, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Every believer is gifted. Every believer. Now, we used to have a spiritual gifts test that we used to give people when I pastored to help them find their spiritual gifting. And I've kind of changed my attitude on that. I think, I think it's better for you to discover it. <laughs> because if I tell you what your spiritual gift is, you may focus on that and forget everything else. <laughs> <laughs> if I tell you you're a prophet, you're going to be so focused on being a prophet, you're going to forget that God may want to use you as a servant also. Ooh. Do you hear what I'm saying? Um, you know, if the gift is lifting up Jesus, it's kind of hard to operate in your gift and pride. Does that make sense? Because pride yes. is about lifting you up. You can have an effective gift with the wrong attitude. How many of y'all have ever met a prophet that had a terrible attitude? How many of y'all have ever met an elder that had a terrible attitude? or an apostle that thought he and Jesus were like number one. <laughs> so you can have a great gifting, but the wrong attitude. Attitude is important. Okay. Now, you know, he told them that they were pagans in verse two. You were all pagans at one time. And, and what he was saying is that you've come out of a pagan culture, verse two. You've come out of a pagan culture and you still have the mindset of your culture. Mm. So he's addressing that saying, you, you, you need the kingdom culture because, I mean, he, he very plainly tells them, maybe I need to read it. So he says, uh, You know that you were pagans. Somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. So he's saying, y'all have come out of the temple of Diana and, and these other cults and temple prostitution and all of these other things. He said, you were led astray. And in the Greek, it says, and even today are being led astray. Did you catch that? You were led astray, and some of you are still continuing to be led astray by your culture. Maybe the Roman culture. Maybe a cult culture. And, and he's saying this is affecting the gospel because you haven't yeah. come out of your culture. You were led astray. And so and that's why he goes on and he says, you know, you cannot say Jesus is Lord. And <laughs> boy, we, you know, the church is really messed up. I've, I've been in, I've been in services where people thought they were casting out a demon. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they would say, say Jesus is Lord. Have you ever seen this? Because, you know, they take that passage, except by the Spirit of God, you can't say Jesus is Lord, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would watch these people casting out demons, and they would tell that person, say Jesus is Lord. And they would say, <laughs> uh, Jesus is Lord. And it really totally messed up the group that was casting the demon out. <laughs> because, you know, the demon had already foamed at the mouth and, and was talking in a different voice and, 
and wiggling on the ground like a snake. And so then they say, say Jesus is Lord. Say Jesus is Lord. Right now, say Jesus is Lord. And the person would say, not the demon, but the person. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, wow, now what do we do? The demon's not supposed to be able to say that. Well, what does that mean? You know, uh, there are several interpretations of this, but a, in the Jewish synagogue, if you became a Christian, okay, they didn't want Christians in the Jewish synagogue. So they were going to kick you out of the synagogue unless you said Jesus Christ is accursed. They would make you curse Jesus Christ. That he's not the Messiah. You need to curse him or we're going to kick you out of the synagogue. Now, I don't know what we're doing when we're casting demons out, but, <laughs> I, you know, I don't think the demon is getting kicked out of the synagogue. That's for sure. <laughs> but I want you to look, I want you to show you the Bible. See, we need to look at it. Look at Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter yeah. 26. You, this will really help you see it. Yeah. Acts chapter 26, verse 11. Are you there? Paul said, that's my brother, Rob. Hey, Rob. <laughs> so in verse 11, he said, many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. See what I was just telling you? I would go yes. to the synagogue and I would try to force them to say Jesus is accursed. <laughs> you need to curse Jesus if you're going to stay. That's what Paul was referring to. Yeah, mine says that way. What does yours say? Read it. It says, many, many times I had them punished in the synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. I was yeah. so violently opposed to them. So, you see what they're talking about in Corinthians? It's, it's not talking about casting out a demon. <laughs> yeah. It says, therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. Do you see that? Do you see how it's connected that you would get kicked out of the synagogue? If you want to look it up on the internet, it's called the 18 benedictions. That's what it's called on the internet. The 18 benedictions of the Jewish synagogue is if you don't say Jesus is a curse, you're going to get kicked out of the synagogue. So that's, you know, I, I believe what it's, it's saying, this is just my own thing, that uh, when you say Jesus is Lord, you're not going to say that it's not talking about a confession of the mouth. It's really talking about your life. That you're going to live Jesus is Lord. You're going to live a life that declares mm. Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And people are going to see that. And if you're living in the spirit, people are going to see that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Amen. And, you know, look in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 28. Luke 8, verse 28. Are you there? Yes. And when Jesus, when the demon saw Jesus, he cried out, fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, what do you want to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Now, there is a demon confessing Jesus. <laughs> right? 
Mm. So, you know, you have to put scripture together to see what scripture is saying. So we know it can't be that a person that has a demon cannot say Jesus is Lord because we have a demon doing this right here. So that's how you study. So we know it can't be that. So sometimes it's the process of elimination. What is that passage really saying? Well, we know it's that a demon can't say that. You know, there were many Jesuses in Jesus' day. So what Jesus? <laughs> you know, you mm -hmm. could say that Jesus is Lord. So we know it's got to be more than just a confession of the mouth. I think what the Bible is saying is, you got to understand these people that come out of pagan cults and their old culture was still with them. And he's saying, look, when you confess Jesus as Lord, you're going to live a life that is affected by the kingdom of God and not affected by the kingdom of Corinth or the kingdom of this world. Your life is going to declare Jesus as Lord. And, uh, you know, that, that was the New Testament confession anyway, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, right? Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. There was a, that wasn't just saying if you can say, right? It's not just mm -hmm. saying if you can say Jesus is Lord. It's the confession of your mouth that comes from your heart and your life that you're living a life of Jesus as Lord. And that's why today, you know, I know a lot of people baptize in Jesus' name, right? Pentecostals. Are you all familiar with that? Yes. Pentecostals baptize in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know some people that baptize in all three and Jesus' name, just to make sure they get it in there. And they're doing that because they don't know what the Bible says. So they go, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and in Jesus' name. You know, so it's like, I don't want to miss it. Because, you know, if you believe you have to be baptized to go to heaven, and they baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and not in Jesus' name, you could go to hell. Wow, that would be bad, wouldn't it? <laughs> You know, I gave my life to Jesus. My life has been changed, but I got baptized. They didn't baptize me in the name of Jesus. I'm going to go to hell. Wow. You got to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not talking about that. It's not talking about just the name. The name is who he is. You know, a name has meaning like in Africa. It doesn't here, but you know, a name means something in Africa. And has a meaning yeah. behind it. And, and so Jesus' name, you know, he was Christos, Christ. He was the anointed one, the Messiah. So when you baptize somebody in Jesus' name, you're baptizing them into his lordship, into his deity, into his power. You're being baptized into his kingdom. Not just the name. You're being baptized into the essence of who Jesus is. Are we together on this? Yes. It's not just the name. You're being, you know, they baptized in the Old Testament. Old ta baptism is an Old Testament practice. So, you know, it's not like if you don't get, get it right. You know, isn't that religion? Listen, if you don't dot that I and cross that T, it's going to cost you forever in hell. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Can you see a person standing before God on judgment day? Wow, you gave your life to me. You won tens of thousands of people to Jesus. Depart from me. You were not baptized in Jesus' name. <laughs> uh, 
So, you know, we need to get that right. You know, yeah. make sure you get it right. I, I just want to real quick uh, cover some of the gifts. I, I want to give you an idea of how the gifts work. Okay, so I have to illustrate this on a small screen, but this is how spiritual gifts work. Imagine, and I used to do this at my church. Imagine me having a tray, you know, a big tray with about nine cups of tea, Kenya tea. And I'm, <laughs> I'm walking in to this little fellowship from the kitchen with nine cups of Kenya tea. And they're all sitting in a circle. And I stumble and fall. And the tea goes everywhere. Okay? Now, here's how the gifts would work. The gift of service would do what? Jump to his feet, grab a towel, and, and say, don't, don't, don't worry, it's okay, and start cleaning. Right? Because that's, yeah. that's yes. him. That's what the servant, he does that. But the gifted administrator's doing what? Uh, somebody get another towel. Uh, could you run and move those chairs over this way, please? Uh, someone turn the lights up so we can see. Oh, uh, y'all scoot back, scoot back. <laughs> right? <laughs> the administrator starts administrating while the servants, they're cleaning. The prophet, the prophet is saying, oh, oh, God. Somebody's got to teach you how to carry tea. I'm telling you, you just, you know, you've not had enough practice. You really need to, ah, I don't know. You know, they shouldn't allow you to carry tea. You're too young in the Lord right now. I mean, the teacher jumps up and says, oh, no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Let me show you. Look, if you hold the tray just like this, look, see, see how you can balance it better now and you walk. See, wow. see how much, see, I'm showing you how to do this. The evangelist, he's saying, listen, I know y'all just saw a mess, but if you don't know Jesus, <laughs> this is a real good time. This is a break in the service. It's an opportunity for you to be saved. The one that has the gift of healing said, oh, I saw that, that hot tea hit your leg. Can I pray for you? The word of wisdom comes along and it says, listen, listen, I, I, you know, you need to begin to do this and this and it'll really help you. The word of knowledge says, you know, the reason why you tripped is when you were a young child, your dad used to never let you carry a tray. And so you were very nervous because when you were a child, this is what happened to you. And he gets a word of knowledge. Are you with me? Powerful. See, they're working together. And you see how powerful it is? Whereas if just the servant jumped up and said, no, 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 let me clean. And everybody says, yeah, clean, 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 please. <laughs> Could you hurry? We're trying to have a Bible study. <laughs> That's not a very powerful body because only one part was functioning. Now on the gifts, there's three breakdowns of gifts. One, there's the vocal gifts. Vocal gifts help you to speak like Jesus. Prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues. See, those are vocal gifts, right? Isn't that interesting that early in this, Paul said, you served mute gods. <laughs> he said the gods that you served couldn't speak, but we serve the word, the living word, Lagos. We serve a God that speaks in prophecy and tongues and interpretation of tongues. And you come out of a culture of serving dumb gods that can't speak. So there's vocal gifts. It teaches to speak like Jesus. There's power gifts that teach us to act like Jesus. Faith, healings, miracles. Now we're acting like Jesus. Faith healing, miracles, tongues, and prophecy and interpretation. We're speaking like Jesus. And then there's the revelatory gifts. This helps us to think like Jesus. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. 
See, heaven is coming to earth so that we can speak like Jesus, act like Jesus, and think like Jesus. Are we together? Everybody together? The second group you say, uh, sorry, the second group you say is which group? Power gifts. Power gifts. Power gifts. Helps us to act like Jesus. Jesus acted in tremendous power. Faith, healings, miracles. Now, uh, do, are we together on all this? Uh, on the third one, please. <laughs> revelatory. Revelatory gifts. Gifts of revelation. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. That helps us to think like Jesus. Amen. Okay? Now let me break these down and tell you what each one. <clears throat> what is the word of wisdom? And, and I'm going to emphasize right here. To me, to me personally. I think this is one of the most needed gifts today in the church. Wisdom. And the word of wisdom is the ability to find solutions to human problems. The word of wisdom is a word that finds a solution, a supernatural solution to human problems. Beyond education and knowledge and experience, You remember Solomon? Remember the woman, they had babies and, and the woman she rolled over on top of her child and killed the child. I don't know if y'all remember the story. She was yes. asleep and she rolled over and killed her baby and slept on her baby. Mm -hmm. and got the other baby, was nursing the baby and she said, you stole my baby. And so they went to Solomon, remember? We got a problem. <laughs> we really have a problem. Whose baby is this? Who's the mother? Both of them claim to be the mother. How are we going to find the solution to this? And Solomon says, okay, bring me the baby. Give me a sword. I'm going to cut this baby in half. And one of the women said, no, 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 no. It, let her have the baby. Solomon says, that's the true mother. If you would have been the mother, you would have said, this other one would have said, no, please don't kill the baby. But the one who wasn't the mother didn't, didn't care if the baby died. Is, do you see why we need wisdom today? I, I pray over my boys every day that God gives them wisdom. Listen, I'm, I'm going to give you some points on this. Our wisdom is foolishness to God. The most intellectual person on the planet, multiplied by a million, is foolish to God. Because God's wisdom is so infinite. It's beyond our realm of being humans. It's supernatural wisdom that God makes available to us. And he even said in James to ask for it. Yeah, This is something we need today, listen, to navigate your life in this world. You must have the wisdom of God. You can't navigate in this world without having God's wisdom. My son is a computer programmer. He programs for oil companies. He writes programs. And, and he and I are working on a program for the stock market that will buy the stock, sell the stock, and we don't have to do nothing. So <laughs> it, How easy. It, it finds the stock, buys the stock, and sells the stock. So, so this is what I tell Carmen. Carmen, God knows more about programming, computer programming, than anybody in the world multiplied by a million. See, before we had computers, God knew about computers. Hallelujah. 
And so I tell Carmen, ask God to give you a little piece of what he knows about computers. And you could be 20 years ahead of any programmer because God's already there. Amen. You hear me? Do you know, I tell musicians, don't just let music dictate to you how to write music. God knows more about music than any music. To, do you know when you get to heaven, there will be notes that the earth has never heard? Mm. There will be chords that have never been played on earth. Hmm. Why not get them now? <laughs> Amen. And let earth enjoy heavenly music that hasn't been revealed to the earth yet. Hallelujah. So we say, God, give me your wisdom in music. It's so needed today. You know, I, I have many times, and I don't want to go into the details, when I pastored and even for a person, I'll say, God, I need your wisdom on a financial decision. It's a log jam. I'm facing a financial decision. There is no answer. There is no answer. Humanly speaking, there is no answer for this financial dilemma. And I would pray and just pray and say, God, you are the God of all wisdom. Nothing is impossible. Amen. Nothing is beyond your wisdom. So God speak to me. And you know, at night, several times, God has spoke to me about what to do. It blew people's minds. It's like, how? Where did you get that? And that was years ago. And today, it's still operating. <laughs> Amen. So see, you can ask God for wisdom on financial decisions. How many of you know that God knows more about finances than every country and leader and, and every economic wizard? God knows more about money than anybody. Mm. Maybe we should ask him what to do. You see, your God knows more about money than your investor. He knows more about money than your banker. I really want you to hear this. We can get a word of wisdom about a situation. When my sister got saved, this was a word of wisdom. My sister got saved out of the mob. My sister was involved in the Italian mafia called the Costa Nostra. <laughs> she was partnered with a hitman from the mob. When she gave her life to Jesus, they knew everything about me, that I was at Houston Baptist University. They knew everything about our family, the mob. And when she got saved one night when I was in the university, she called me on the phone and she said, the hitman, his name was Junior. Junior just called me and he said, stay there. I'm coming to your house right now. Because she told him, I'm not going to sell drugs anymore. I'm not going to sell drugs. My brothers prayed with me. I've given my life to Jesus. I'm not going to do it. And he said, I'm coming over. And she called me at my dorm and said, they're coming to kill me. In about 30 minutes, I'm going to be dead. They know where I, they know everything about me. What do I do? What do I do? They're coming to kill me. And right then on the phone, I remember I prayed. I said, God, I need a word of wisdom. And I, God spoke. I said, you, you need to call him back right now. I don't want to keep you on the phone long because he's going to be leaving. We didn't have cell phones then. Call him back right now and blame it on Jesus. Tell him, I can't do this anymore because now Jesus is my Lord and I love Jesus and I want to serve Jesus and I don't want to do this anymore because of Jesus. She hung up the phone. She called the hitman and she said, I can't. She said that and the guy purred like a kitty cat and said, okay, you'll never hear from us again. Wow. A word of wisdom. Amen. We need that so desperately. Listen, whatever you're facing, 
God can give you. That doesn't mean he's going to give you a word of wisdom about everything. Remember, he doesn't hide things from you. He hides things for you. Mm. So he may not reveal it to you now. But for every situation, there's a word of wisdom in heaven waiting. He may not give it to you right then, but it's there. It's available to you. And so when you speak to people using the word of wisdom, it will give them an answer that'll blow their mind. It's, it's wisdom from another realm. The word of knowledge, the purpose of the word of knowledge is to build the faith of the person receiving the word of knowledge. And the word of knowledge and prophecy, they look a whole lot alike. But the word of knowledge is about past events. The word of knowledge is about past events. Prophecy is about the future. But a word of knowledge looks back. Are we together on that? Yes. I'll give you an example of a word of knowledge. I've had people come forward when I pray for them as a pastor. And uh, many times when people would come, I don't have time to do this a lot in Africa because, you know, because I preach so long. But when I minister to people, sometimes they would come up and I would just stand there. Sometimes I lay my hands on them. Uh, sometimes I just stand there to wait and let God speak. Sometimes he'll give me a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. But there's many times I've operated in the word, <clears throat> in the word of knowledge. And I would say to them, uh, and this is how I do it. Uh, don't copy me. This is me. And I'll say, I'm going to tell you something. And, and I'm not saying I'm right. Because I don't want to speak something if I miss God into their life and they receive it and I'm wrong. Are we together? So I'll say, I'm going to tell you what God, I think God is telling me. And if I'm right, then you will confirm it. And I'll say, when you were before a teenager, you were sexually abused. And immediately they would <gasps> just break and crying from deep. It's a cry that comes from deep. And it, <gasps> because that word of knowledge was right on. It built their faith like, wow, this is God. And then that opened the door for me to pray for them to get free of maybe unforgiveness that they've been harboring because of that. And, and a lot of times I'll get words of knowledge when I'm praying with people, <clears throat> which is just, you know, Jesus did with Nathaniel. Nathaniel, how about that, Timo? Isn't that your baby's name? Nathaniel, isn't it? So, you know, Jesus with Nathaniel, Remember, he, 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 can't saw him, remember. <laughs> he saw him under the fig tree. <laughs> you, know? you know, Stephen went and got him and brought him. You Philip, I mean, Philip went and got him and brought him. And remember what he said? He said, I saw you under the fig tree. Mm. And Jesus wasn't even there. But he was looking in the past and saw where he was. That's a word of knowledge. I saw you under the fig tree. And he, man, he immediately became a believer. Amen. Because the word of knowledge gives people that, that degree of faith. So, and those are important if you minister to people. To just have, you know, and, you know, I've heard people say wisdom is nothing but a listening ear. And when I operate in the word of knowledge, there's always faith involved. So I'll go to a church sometimes, and I don't know anybody. And, and before I get to the church, God will say, there's someone there, their left ear, they can't hear out of it. I'm going to heal them. Amen. See, that's a word of knowledge about somebody's life in the past. And I'd get there and say, now, 
And then when I get to the church, this really, I'm just going to be honest, it's kind of scary to me. So I'm in front of this church with 500 people and God will speak to me and say, they're sitting over in that section over there. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. Oh, God. So he wants me to get up behind the pulpit and say, there's someone sitting over here, your left ear, right? And then once you start to flow in it, I don't know if this has happened to you, he gives you more revelation. So you obeyed God, you start walking in it, and then he tells you more. And so you go, there's someone over in this section. It's your left ear. As a matter of fact, it's been like that for 10 years. And you're like, oh, Jesus, if I'm wrong, I'm going to look like an idiot. And you know, God likes that. Hmm. See, God Amen. likes for you to take a chance. Yes, you know, yes, you see, he does. You cannot walk on the water until you get out of the boat. Hmm. And so once you take that step, and then that person, I'll say, stand up. And I'm going, God, if they're not there, nobody's going to stand. And sure enough, somebody stands. And they're usually crying. And they're going, 10 years ago, this happened to my left ear. And I'd say, now, why would God tell me that just to tell me? I don't need to know that. But obviously, he told me that so he could heal you today. Amen. Why else would he say that? So that word of knowledge increased their faith. And then Amen. you prayed for them and their ear, her ear opened. I was at a church, one of the churches that supports us. And on driving to church, I'm always kind of open to God on the way to church. Like, speak to me. I'm available. If you want me to operate in this gift, I will. Uh, even though I might be a little afraid, but I'm open. You know, I'm open, God, if that's what you want me to do. And I was driving to this one church, and God said, there's a man, his left shoulder has been messed up because of a car accident. I'm going to heal it. I'm like, wow, this is a big church. So I walk in the front door, and this man comes up to me. He goes, oh, Don, he's a friend of mine. As a matter of fact, uh, it's David. Timo, David, and Ida. It was David. David came up to me. He said, Man, I was in an accident. My left shoulder's really messed up. No, he said, man, I was in an accident, and I stopped him. I said, no, 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 say nothing else. Your left <laughs> shoulder's messed up. He goes, yes, how did you know? I said, you know, it's not important. I know, obviously, because God told me so that he could heal you. He was healed right yeah. there, standing in the foyer of the church. So that's the word of knowledge. But you have to be, you know, you have to be a little... Let me see, you have to be a little, a little crazy. <laughs> That's true. You know, you have to be willing to get out of the boat, you know? And I can't tell you how many thousands of times this has happened to me. Sometimes I'm driving to church and God will give me a word and I'll go, oh, no, 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 God. You know, you don't really want me to say that. <laughs> God, I don't want to say that. But you get there and God gives you boldness and you say it. And the kingdom connects with that church that morning because they saw a spiritual gift working. Amen. Now, gifts of healings is there's many kinds of healings. Emotional healing. You know, a lot of people need emotional healing. They've been abused. They've been beaten. Words have been spoken over them as little kids. Somebody really wounded them deeply in their emotions and they've carried it. They need emotional healing. Mm. And, and that gifts of healings is to, to be able to pray over their emotions to be healed. And many times when you're praying over someone's emotions, God will give you a word of knowledge that one of the process of your healing is forgiveness. And sometimes God will say, it's your stepfather. Such mm -hmm. and such happened in this. And so the gift of knowledge is working with the gifts of healings and the person's emotions is healed. Amen. Physical healing. And then there's mental anguish. People that are tormented in their mind. 
that needs healing. So we think of healing as physical, but God means healing to be physical, mental, spiritual, psychological. There's many kinds of healings that people need. Amen. So those are very, very important today. I mean, do you agree that we live in a broken, messed up world? Yes, we do. I mean, people are messed up. Completely. So we've got to be able to operate in these things to see them get set free. Mm -hmm. Another really important gift today is the discerning of spirits. You got to know the motive behind the manifestation. <laughs> well, we'll say it again, please. Discerning of spirits is to know the motive behind a manifestation. To know the motive behind the manifestation. To know if it's man or God or the devil. Discerning of spirits will help you to know what's going on in the spirit realm. To see behind the scene. And, and you know that today, some things look like the Holy Spirit, but it's not. Amen? Amen. Some things look like the Holy Spirit, but it's not. Some things look like it's not the Holy Spirit, but it is. <laughs> mm. And if you don't know how to discern behind the scenes, to know the motive behind the motivation, you will find yourself rebuking the Spirit of God mm. and embracing the work of the demonic. You have to be able to discern what's working there. Some things when I pastored would be happening in the church and I couldn't get an answer right then. Sometimes I would have to, it would take me a couple of days of really seeking God, saying, God, what, what is really working here? It appears to me that it's demonic. But is that my flesh saying this, and I want to rebuke it? I don't want to rebuke it if it's you. Mm. And I don't want to embrace it if it's demonic. So I really need to discern spirits. What's working here? What's the motive here? You remember the young girl that was following Paul? And, you know, she could, she could tell the future. It's in Acts 16. And she could tell the future. And she followed behind Paul for several days. And she said... These are holy men of God, and they bring a message of righteousness. Mm. Well, most people today would be telling that woman, amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for this young woman telling people that I'm a holy man of God, and that I have a message of righteousness. Glory to God. But because Paul had discernment, yeah. He knew it was demonic. And he bound that spirit. And of course, then the people in the city got mad at him because the business people lost the money because she could no longer tell the future. <laughs> <laughs> There's a real message in there. You know, when you do what God wants you to do, sometimes it can get you in trouble. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so... So, you know, that was being able to discern. See, it sounded like it was God, mm -hmm. but it was the devil. And some things can sound like the devil, but they're God. 
So you have to be able to discern kingdom. Do you agree with me that the kingdom operates very differently than the world? Mm -hmm. And if you don't get familiar, very familiar with the kingdom culture, if you don't familiarize yourself with the kingdom culture, you'll find yourself not able to discern the kingdom from darkness. Mm. Are you with me? And I can yes. tell you this, studying the word of God will help you with this more than anything. You, listen, Amen. you can pray six days a week and not have discernment. You have to have the truth in your heart to be able to discern the truth from a lie. If you don't know the truth, how do you know it's a lie? You have to be able to discern. And especially for leaders, because God will send people into your church that are demonically motivated to sow discord into the church. And if you can't see the motive through discernment of spirits, that person will bring great destruction to your church. And believe me. That's true. The devil knows how to put tares with the wheat. Ooh. And I don't know if you've ever studied the tear in the wheat, but did you know that a tear looks exactly like wheat? Did you know that? If you held them next to each other, you couldn't tell the difference. The only difference is when you open up the tear, it's empty and it has no grain, no fruit, oh. no fruit. True wheat has fruit, but the tare has no fruit. <laughs> so you have, you have to discern, is this a tare or a wheat? And you know, that passage even says that the devil at night, he comes and sows weeds. <laughs> he wants to put weeds in the kingdom. And we have to be able to discern that. So without discernment, you'll find yourself welcoming demons and sending off people that are anointed. <laughs> Amen. Are we together? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Everybody okay? I know your brain is hurting. I'm almost done. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Different. It's powerful. Of, different kinds of tongues. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 says there's the tongues of men and of angels. Right? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I'm a noisy gong. Right? Mm. Listen. There is tongues of men and angels. There is a tongue of languages. Pentecost. They were speaking in tongues, but everybody heard in their own language. You know, there's people, missionaries, that I've read about that have gone to a country and the interpreter did not show up. And the Spirit of God came on that missionary and spoke in Chinese and ministered a whole sermon and did not know Chinese. See, there is tongues of men, languages, but then there's the tongues of angels. Now, I don't know what language the angels speak, and it's probably many languages, but I know that they communicate, even the, the Godhead communicated in creation, because it said, let us make man in our image. So there is, I don't know what language God speaks, and neither do you. But when we speak in the tongues of men, or it's called a heavenly language, we're speaking the language of the kingdom. I don't know what that is. I've heard some people speaking in tongues that sounded Chinese, and some of it sounded Spanish, and some of it sounded like Swahili. <laughs> but it's a heavenly language. 
And then there's the tongue that has to have an interpretation. That's different from praying. You pray in tongues, and Paul said, I would that all of you would pray in tongues. Amen? Yes. Paul said, I'm glad more than you all that I pray in tongues. <laughs> right? But the Bible yeah. says God appoints the gifts as he sees fit. So why would Paul say, I wish all of you would pray in tongues. If it, if it was the gift of tongues, then Paul would be putting himself in the place of God appointing gifts. But Paul knew God is the one that appointed the gifts. Paul was talking about something different than speaking a message in tongues and praying in tongues. Two completely different things. And the one that speaks in a tongue in a service needs the interpreter of the tongues. So if it was a language, you would just need to record it and let people that study linguistics listen to it and translate it. But if it's a heavenly language, you're going to need a heavenly interpreter <laughs> mm -hmm. to tell the church what that message is. And the purpose of that, again, is to build up the church. And when unbelievers come in, then they're going to, you know, evangelism takes place when the gifts work. Remember, it said people will fall down and, and they're going to become a believer. So different kinds of tongue. Praying in tongues edifies myself. 1 Corinthians 14, it edifies yourself. It's for personal edification and growth. Personal edification and growth. <clears throat> Tongues as a ministry is for the edification of the church. Mm -hmm. Personal things, it edifies me. And I tell people that, you know, they just kind of resist praying in tongues. I go, look, do you ever need to be edified? <laughs> yes. I need edification every day. So in, you know what I can do? I can pray in tongues, and the Bible says it will edify me. So I pray in tongues because of that. Prophecy is one of the gifts. You know, prophecy, listen, a lot of the prophecy we have today is not prophecy. If it doesn't edify and build that person up and comfort them, it's not God. A lot of prophets beat on people. I've had prophets tell people who they're supposed to marry, if they're supposed to leave their husband or their wife. Prophets that have told people where and totally destroyed their life, destroyed their future mm. by telling them Things that aren't edifying. A prophet, even in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, he was a very hard prophet, but when he prophesied, he always had the answer. <laughs> See, we prophesy and just tell them what's wrong. But a true prophet tells the answer. Are we together? Amen. And not everybody that prophesies mm. has the gift of prophecy. Some people prophesy and don't have the gift of prophecy. A true prophet, yeah. they prophesy on a regular basis. So, and I know, and you have too, I know I, there's been times I'm not a prophet, but there's been times I've operated in the gift of prophecy. My gift is not healings, but I've seen thousands of people healed. You know, my gift is teaching and my gift is evangelism. Those are the two strong gifts that I flow in, teaching and evangelism. There's the gift of faith. And by the way, the gift of faith, I don't believe stays with you all the time. I believe that's a gift that will come to you in an unusual situation. The gift of faith, it's your normal level of faith. It's proportionate with your understanding of scripture, okay? The normal level of faith in your life is proportionate with your understanding of scripture and God. But the gift of faith is an unusual ability to believe God. It's higher and greater than your current level of spirituality. You understand me? Mm -hmm. Your understanding of God is here. 
But when the gift of faith comes in, it exceeds your spirituality. It's a short-lived gift. I don't think it stays because I think God knows that it would, it would destroy us. We would become arrogant and uh, proudful. But that gift of faith will come on you and, and either pull the body through something or you through something. Uh, but I don't think it stays. I don't think that I've never seen anybody that walked in that perpetually. Okay. Yes. Uh, the gift of miracles. This is God working beyond the natural. Here's an example. You know, I don't walk in the gifts of miracles, but I've seen miracles happen. They've come on me. Our first trip to Africa. It was a terrible drought in the Rift Valley, <clears throat> five-year drought. First time I'd ever been there. We lived in the bush for 30 days. <laughs> in the bush, in Iwaso, in the Rift Valley. And I mean, we were going through culture shock because I'd never met a Messiah. But I mean, they had beads all in their ears and they, I mean, <laughs> And we're like, oh my God, we know God sent us here, but, and they spoke a different language and they ate a different kind of food. And I mean, my wife and I are like, wow, God sent us here. And we don't even know what they're saying. Their language was different, but I knew God sent me there. And that night I laid in bed and I said, God, what do you want me to preach tomorrow? You know, I never read a book, how to be a missionary. I just obeyed you and came here. And here we are on the <laughs> other side of the world. I'm supposed to preach tomorrow, an open air meeting. And what do I say as a missionary? <laughs> I don't know. God said, tell them the drought is over. Amen. So I laid in bed and I said, so God, what do you want me to tell them tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I don't believe God repeats himself. <laughs> I believe we just hear the echo. So I said, now, so God, I acted like I didn't hear him. So God, now, what do you want me to preach tomorrow? And I heard the echo. <laughs> Tell them the drought is over. And so I argued with God. This will tell you where I'm at with God. I'm like, God, I don't know if this is really you. And if I get up and tell them the drought's over and it's not you, I mean, oh, Jesus. Oh, God, I mean, really, God, I, I, give me a sermon. Tell them the drought is over. <laughs> I'm like, come on, God, give me a break. The next day, I finally told God I wasn't going to tell him. I did. You know what God said when I told him, I'm not going to do that. God said, okay. Really? He said, okay. So when I got up to preach, the anointing fell on me. Oh. Oh, boy, when the anointing gets on you. You know, in other words, when you start thinking like God thinks, <laughs> And I got under that anointing and out of my mouth, I said, the drought is over. And I go, shut up. The translator said, <laughs> said it in my time. the drought is over. I said it the second time. I'll never forget this. I said, the drought is over. I go, shut up. Don't say it again. The guy translated it. They started clapping, woo, shouting. The drought was over. Honest to God, we left that day to go to another area. And for one month, every place we went, it started raining. I promise. Wow, amen. Five amen. years of no rain. And every place we went, it started raining. They started calling other areas saying, listen, there's a white prophet that can bring rain. We were getting invitations from everywhere to come and bring rain and to preach. And that was our first trip to Africa. And it was God doing a miracle to give us favor with the Maasai. Because then they recognize this guy must be a prophet, you know, to be able to come and to see Amen. every single place it would rain. That's how miracles work. So, you know, that's how the gifts, <clears throat> and I'm going to leave a lot out because it's just so much. And I know you're tired, but I'll give all the notes to Timo. It's, it's a lot of pages. You really want to stand move. <laughs> so... Questions. I know I've covered a lot of ground. I, I, I'm sorry it's so long, but 
I don't know how we got to get through this. <laughs> Any questions? I feel like we are missing out so much on the gifts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's what Paul was saying. I don't want you to be ignorant. You know, and the church, this is the way to bring the kingdom to your area. Mm. And a lot of them are misused today, I think. Yeah. I think they're really misused. And they're bringing glory to people and not glory to God. They don't edify yeah. the church, they edify a person. And, and we have to get these things kind of right, you know, and, and not worry about it being right because God wants us to enjoy the kingdom. But I think by knowing the word of God, you can enjoy this. You know, when you know how the gifts work and you know that, then you can, does that make sense? Then you just flow in it. You know, it's like, you know, and you can be in a service and go, that's not of God. Huh? You know, that, that is of God, huh? but this one I'm going to have to kind of quiet. You know, we'd have a lady come to our church and she was real loud and she loved Jesus, but she would be in that corner and she, whoa, 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 hey, you know, every time she'd come. And God said, that's not me. She's doing that to draw attention to herself. So I had to go to her and say, listen, I love you and everything, but as your pastor, I want to give you something to pray about. Well, she got very offended. So I feel like, you know, if you're offended by the truth, you're probably in the wrong place anyway. Mm. See, as your pastor, if you trust me as an overseer over your spiritual life, and you won't let me the word of God is for correction, rebuke, and training and righteousness. And you won't allow me as your overseer to speak that into your life and you get offended. You're probably in the wrong church anyway. Does that make sense? So, but I knew that was not the spirit of God. That's true. It just wasn't. It was, you could feel it in your spirit. And I know y'all have all felt this like, ah, there's something wrong with that manifestation over there. I just... I don't have time to discern exactly what it is and what's behind it and to get a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge. I just know it's not in the flow of the spirit. And we have to learn to listen. To mm. We have to learn to listen to those, you know, hear those voices. I, I hope, is this kind of come together for you or is it kind of blown your mind or? It's a lot. It is. Too much. Yeah. <laughs> Too much. It's coming together. And I think the best example was the tray. I will never, ever forget that. Oh, the tray. And yeah. how the gifts come together. Because when you put it like that, and when everyone contributes, it's so powerful. Yeah as opposed to, you know, putting down the other or just sitting back and not that. I think that for me just brought it all together. Amen. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Innocent, are you with us? Yes. <laughs> Amen. So I, I hope that all of this is encouraging you to, to dig and go further and deeper, you know. Uh, mm. You know, I'm giving you- You also brought wisdom, the word of wisdom out very well. Mm. Oh, the word of, yes. You know, that's the thing that, it's a burden to me that uh, mm. the church and God's people act so far out of wisdom. It really burdens me. If we flowed in the words of wisdom more, we would we would be so much more effective. You know what I'm saying? Amen. And and you know, the words of wisdom for me, they don't just flow, you know, boom, it's there. Mm -hmm. I have to kind of go after it. Mm -hmm. 
you know, like the wisdom for financial decisions. I've, God's given me some insight for financial wisdom, but it, it took all night prayer. It took really seeking him, saying, God, I know you know. Light years ahead of where our economy is right now. So I want to tap into just a little piece of that for this situation. Amen. That will mm. totally rock my personal finances. And you know, mm. God can do that. See, God knows a lot about money. But so many times we lean to our own understanding. I'm going to figure this out. Yes. And God says, no, 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 no. Yeah, you can figure yeah. it out, but you won't get the ultimate answer. I don't mm. want a worldly answer. I want a kingdom answer. Amen. Kingdom finances. Kingdom church. Kingdom, you see what I'm saying? We've got to get so saturated in the kingdom culture that we begin to live out of the kingdom culture, not the American culture, not the Kenyan culture. We've got to be so saturated in the kingdom culture that we think, breathe, eat, live kingdom. And we, we, we move back and forth, don't we? You know, like probably Sunday morning, we're trying more than anything to operate out of the kingdom culture. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe we're not making the effort to. So it's really important that we get so saturated in that kingdom culture. Amen. 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 Hey, I love y'all. All right, I, I hope I'm not overloading you. <laughs> You know, I'm just trying to teach. No, this is powerful. Yeah. You know, okay. and I can't do this. Remember I told you, not everybody enjoys this kind of teaching. When we first started this, I said, not everybody. They want jelly. They don't want the bread. <laughs> they want jam. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we're doing just bread, forget the jam. Yeah. And so even at my church, which is powerful, you know, I think this kind of teaching will grow you more than just True. a lot of jam preaching. True. And there's nothing yes. with jam preaching. I think people need to be encouraged and inspired, you know, that inspires people. But I think I've been around long enough. I know that inspiration is not what's going to get you through tribulation. Hey, yes. It's the truth that's going to get you through tribulation. Inspiration will make you feel good for yes. Sunday morning. But the truth will be with you whenever you face difficulties and stuff. Amen. But I love each of y'all. Sylvia, you're such an encouragement and such a blessing. And I love coming to your church. Innocent. Y'all have a very powerful Amen. church. Wonderful. You tell all of my Congolese family that I love them with everything in me, and I'm going to come see them. Franklin, man, I'm, you know, I'm just blessed by you because you just have a heart for God, and, and I see you. that in you. And that's, I, I love to see young people that are just hungry for God, and uh, that, that encourages me. Amen. To see someone that's hungry, and you want God to use you, and you want to comprehend the truth, and you know, you, if you stay on the path you're on, there's no telling in what incredible kingdom ways God's going to bless you. Mm, and I'm not saying yeah. that you're going to preach. You may become a very successful businessman that is able to finance uh, a lot of ministries. I don't know, but if you stay on target, God has more in store for you than ever. And, and Timo, you know, Amen. we couldn't do what we do in Africa without Timo. <laughs> I mean, Timo, Amen. he is really my right-hand man, uh, such an encouragement to us. You know, our ministry has just catapulted because of Timo. You know, Timo can help us Amen. discern. You know, sometimes it's hard for me to discern some of the, some of the things in Kenya. 
but you know, Timo has an easier <laughs> time to turn because he knows the culture of Kenya. Just like <laughs> we all came to the U.S. Mm. to know the culture of the U.S., but I would have an easier time discerning the culture of the U.S. And so we lean heavy on Timo mm. to help us to navigate our way through all of this stuff in Kenya so that we can be effective, you know, with the pastors that we work with. So all of y'all, a blessing. I love you. Let me pray for you. And I'll send you the recording. Amen. Okay. Thank you. God, I, thank I you. thank you so much for these men and this woman of God. God, right here on this screen, there is enough power to shake all of Kenya. Just right here. Amen. To Amen. rock Kenya to its Amen. foundation. And God, I just pray that we would be fine-tuned like a guitar. That it would be fine-tuned so we can play the perfect music and the perfect chords of the kingdom of God. God, help us to bring transformation. Help us to enjoy living for you. To have joy every day knowing that you're a good, good father. And that you love us. And your mercies are new every morning. And your grace can never be exhausted. And that, God, you've declared us to be your righteousness. And there's nothing we can do to get you to love us any less than you love us right now. Thank you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I love you all. Amen. Love you. Thank, Thank you, you next week. so much, Pastor Don. Greetings. Amen. Greetings to Mom Michelle. I'll tell yes. her. And thank you for always showing us the love of Christ, the love of God. Amen. I love all of you. I love you, Timo. I love you, Frank. Innocent. I love you. I love you. Sylvia, keep Amen. going. You're on the right road for something big. Amen. <laughs> thank one, you. Amen. I one, receive it and glory to God. One day I'll be preaching in that mega church there. Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love y'all. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Amen. Bye, Pastor Timothy, Pastor Innocent, and Bye. Franklin. Bye. 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 Bye.